Okay, I just want to welcome you all back to our uh, study in eschatology. This is uh, part 15, I believe, and we want to continue on looking at the prophecies of Ezekiel concerning the future, and we really need to pray about this because I've looked over my notes, my prepared material, about 10 zillion times, and I'm still not as confident as I want to be. So... We were going to ask God to apprehend our class and make it enjoyable and helpful, uh, make it so that the things that are shared are truthful, and that God is uh, honored in all that we're doing here. That's what we really want to see. So let's pray, and we'll commit all these things to God's care. Our dear, blessed, and holy God of heaven, we're so grateful, Lord, that uh, you loved us first, and you called us to believe in you, and you redeemed us at a very high price. And uh, Lord, today... We want to consult your precious word, and your Bible tells us that you've magnified your word above your name, and we don't really even understand all that, but your word must be very important to you. So, Lord, we want to be found uh, to be uh, capable, careful workmen, which needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth tonight. And so we commit what we're doing to the tender care and ministry of God. We pray that his blessed Holy Spirit will empower the teaching and the learning. And so we commit what we're doing to you today in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise God. So we are in the prophecies of Ezekiel. We're in chapter 38 tonight, picking, uh, picking up exactly where we left off uh, last lecture. In Ezekiel 38 and 39, Ezekiel looks ahead to a day future to our own, in which there is a colossal battle involving a coalition of forces coming out of the north, and they gather themselves together and they assault Israel, or they attempt to, but God steps in and crushes the whole operation in spectacular fashion. And we want to know more about this battle, and we want to know where it fits on the timeline. And I think I mentioned last time, I really don't know. Uh, if you ask me on Monday, I may lean in one direction, but then maybe on Wednesday I've changed my mind on this. Because I've gone to conferences, prophecy conferences, men with PhDs who have spent their whole lives you know, studying this stuff and praying about it and searching the scriptures and consulting other experts. And in one conference you can have two guys get up at different times and give us totally different perspectives on Ezekiel 38-39. So you, you'll be uh, easy on me, right, <laughs> if, I, if I'm not dogmatic on this. But we want to search the scriptures uh, together here. So let's go back to Ezekiel 38. And remember the antagonist here, uh, Ezekiel 38, verses 1 to 4. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, Tubal and prophesy against him and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal. I will turn you around and put hooks in your jaws and lead you out with all your army, horses, and horsemen, all splendidly clothed, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And he's going to bring this coalition again against his people Israel, but then he will destroy them for doing that. We were very interested in this man, Gog. Gog means the roof, or, or the man on top, the dictator. He is, he is a man of uh, great influence. He's a world Gentile power, it sounds like to me. And Rosh is more than likely uh, a place name. And I gave us some evidence last week where, uh, from ancient Egyptian documents and other ancient documents, naming Rosh as a place. And most, I think most dispensational uh, theologians, experts in eschatology, they would say that we are talking here about Russia. Because if you go due north from Jerusalem, you just about smack right into Moscow. And you're going to hear a couple times in these passages that this hostility against Israel is coming out of the north, out of the north country. Okay? And um, it, it sounds like Russia to me. And I don't want to keep... You know, just going over the same passages, I want to move ahead here. If we go to verse 5, you're going to see some of the nations that he's picking up along the way. 
who are going to join him in this. Verse 5, Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Persia is what today? Iran, Iran, Iran. Ethiopia, Sudan, Sudan, Kush, Sudan, and Libya, Libya, Libya. Libya. <laughs> or North Africa. This geo- geopolitical divisions change from time to time, right? Take a look at a map of Canada, you know, from 1880. It looks a bit different <laughs> from, from today. But it's, it's hard, right, because geopolitical divisions change. Uh, verse 6, Gomer with all his troops, the house of Togmara, from the far north, note that, and all his troops, many people are with you. Uh, Gomer according to the Talmud, is the Germanic tribes, but others say this is central Turkey. Herodotus and Plutarch would say central Turkey, um, or Cappadocia. That's another way you could say, just Cappadocia. And these guys are coming. It sounds like, again, hostility is originating from the far north. They're joining this coalition from the far north. The aggression begins, apparently, in Russia. Okay, uh, Verse 8 After many days you will be visited, in the latter years you will come back to the land of those brought back from the sword and gathered from many people on the mountains of Israel, which had long been desolate, and they were brought out of the nations, and now all of them dwell safely. Note that we are definitely talking about a long-range prophecy here. Ezekiel says this is the the latter years, the end times. Uh, Israel had been in a state of dispersion since A.D. 70 and only received her statehood in 1948. So this prophecy here that Ezekiel is talking about, this coalition of hostile Gentile forces, it's, got a, it's coming post-1948. This isn't something that happened in history. This is something we're waiting, uh, waiting for to happen. Verse 11, this is God speaking here to Gog. You will say, I will go up against the land of unwalled villages. I will go to a peaceful people who dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates, to take plunder and to take booty, to stretch out your hand against the waste places that are again inhabited and against a people gathered from the nations who have acquired livestock and goods who dwell in the midst of the land. Now notice that. The attack comes during a time of relative peace and safety. So that's, that's got a factor into where we decide to place this battle. It's not like Israel is absolutely war-torn, surrounded by enemies, under constant existential threat. It sounds like they're in a, a state of relative peace and safety. They feel pretty secure at the moment. And that's exactly why Russia, with his, uh, his fellow plunderers, they're going to make a, make a move on Israel. That's exactly why they're going to do it. Uh, It's the time when there's no perceived threats, and they're going to plunder Israel. By the way, what's in Israel worth plundering? Oil. 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 And I think there's some precious stones there, too. The sea. The sea. The Mediterranean there, too. Uh, Whatever's there, I think oil's there for sure. Whatever else is there, Russia wants it. Russia and her allies are going to want it. Okay. Verse uh, 13. Sheba, Dedan, the merchants of Tarshish, and all their young lions will say to you, have you come to take plunder? Have you gathered your army to take booty, to carry away silver and gold, to take away livestock and goods, to take great plunder? Sheba is probably Yemen, Dedan, Saudi Arabia, and Tarshish, the western Mediterranean. And these groups appear shocked. They're absolutely stunned that Russia has decided to make this move against Israel. They ask the question, are you, are you actually going to try this? It's, uh, they're shocked at this. Verse 14, Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say to Gog, Thus says the Lord God, That day when, when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? Again, another reference here. This is it's an important chronological marker. Wherever we choose to place this battle, it's got to be a time in history when Israel is 
dwelling in perceived safety and security. See that verse 14? On that day when my people Israel dwell safely, will you not know it? See, verse 15. Then you will come from your place out of the far north, I suggest Russia, you and many peoples with you, all of them riding on horses, a great company and a mighty army. You will come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will be in the latter days. This is end of the world stuff. That I may bring you against my land so that the nations may know me when I am hallowed in you, O Gog, before their eyes. He's coming out of the far north. It's coming in the last days, the end times. The, the attack is intended by Gog from Magog, the chief prince of Russia, Russia. It's intended by him to plunder Israel. But it's intended by God to reveal his power and presence and his providential care over his covenant nation, Israel. So the, the battle is coming for a couple different reasons. God has his reasons, and Russia has her reasons. But uh, look at verse 18, if you just drop down to verse 18. And it will come to pass at that same time when God comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. For in my jealousy and in, my, in the fire of my wrath I have spoken, surely in that day there shall be a great earthquake in the land of Israel, so that the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, the beasts of the field, all the creeping things that creep on the earth, and all men who are on the face of the earth shall shake at my presence. The mountains shall be thrown down, the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. I will call for a sword against Gog throughout all my mountains, says the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother, and I will bring him to judgment with pestilence, bloodshed. I will rain down on him, on his troops, and on many peoples who are with him, flooding rain, great hailstones, fire, and brimstone. Thus I will magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the, in the eyes of many nations, then shall they know that I am the Lord. Now you read that, that kind of sounds like end of the world stuff. That sounds like Armageddon. So that kind of sounds like end of the tribulation stuff here, right? And yet, Israel's not dwelling safely here, is she? So it probably isn't here in the last half of the tribulation. But it does sound very worldwide in scope. So this battle is going to accomplish some things. I think it will bring about some conversions of Israelites and even non-Israelites will, will be convinced that God is God. Uh, see, I, I'm of the persuasion that, that God is not willing that any should perish. And God will do sup stupendous uh, supernatural sign miracles and judgments in the last days, even during Daniel's 70th week, not just to punish evil people, but to bring people to repentance. And remember, we read some passages out of Isaiah, where it sounds like God is uh, actually inviting people to surrender right there on the battlefield, right there when he's returning in judgment, personally, physically, actually. I, I, I sort of lean in the direction that uh, this is what God wants. He wants people to repent, even in the last moments, the last hour, like that repentant thief. Eh? So that's, that, that's kind of what I'm thinking there. It does sound like uh, Armageddon. Um, yeah, verse 20 is pretty, I mean, it says, uh, it talks about his presence. Uh, they will sh the earth will shake at my presence and all the creeping things and all men. It sounds pretty universal in scope. And as a matter of fact, if you uh, compare some of those supernatural sign judgments to Revelation chapter 16, it sounds like you have a, a correspondence there. And yet, if Revelation 16 is talking about the end of the tribulation period, then these two events are not the same. And it may be that God is going to, to do the same thing a couple times over. God can, can rain hail out of, out of the sky if he wants to. He can shake the earth as many times as he wants to. I sort of lean in that direction, that, that that's what's being said there. But Ezekiel 39 now, we get some more details. Ezekiel 39, verses 1 to 8, let's just read it. God says, You, son of man, prophesy against Gog and say, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach, and Tubal, and I will bring you around and lead you on, bring you up from the far north, and bring you against the mountains of Israel, 
Then I will knock the bow out of your left hand and cause the arrows to fall out of your right hand. You shall fall upon the mountains of Israel, you and all your troops and the peoples who are with you. I will give you to birds of prey of every sort and to the beasts of the field to be devoured. You shall fall on the open field for I have spoken, says the Lord God, and I will send fire on Magog and on those who live securely in the coastlands. Then they shall know that I am the Lord. So I will make my, ho- my holy name known in the midst of my people Israel, and I will not let them profane my holy name anymore. Then the nations shall know that I am the Lord, the Holy One in Israel. Surely it is coming, and it shall be done, says the Lord God. This is the day of which I have spoken. Now again, that does sound like the end of the tribulation, and yet... It doesn't need to be at the end of the tribulation. God can do, again, a spectacular sign judgment against Israel's enemies at any point in earth history, uh, not only to destroy the threat against his people, but to bring about conversions in people who are at that time hostile to God and his claims. And that's, again, I sort of lean uh, in that direction there. In verses 9 and 10, we are told that it's going to take seven years Uh, to burn the weapons of Israel's enemies after this battle and to thoroughly plunder the conquered. Seven seven years of that kind of thing. In verses 11 to 16, seven months of burying the conquered dead to start with. And they're going to be buried in the valley east of the sea. This is the Jezreel Valley. I'm sure your Bible has a map there at the back. Also known as Megiddo or Armageddon. They're going to be burying people there in that place. Verse 16 says, Thus they shall cleanse the land. So, um, if this happens, again, this can't happen at the end of, well, I guess it could happen at the end of the tribulation, but they're going to spend some time during the millennium burying dead people. Maybe, maybe not. Not sure. But there's two phases of burying the dead. The first phase is the animal scavenging that goes on. That sounds a lot like Revelation 19, I'll admit it. And then this phase two will be the actual uh, burial. So you can compare these passages to Revelation 19, 17 to 21. You can do that on your own. It does sound um, like parallel passages, but I'm not sure, to tell you the truth. But just drop down to verse 21 here. Look what it says here in 39.21. God says, I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment, which I have executed, and my hand, which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. The knowledge of God, the understanding of his will, and his ways concerning Israel. That's the main point of this. So that the, the world understands who God is and who his covenant nation is and where they factor in his economy and his plans and purposes. That's the point here, okay? And verses 23 to 26 will uh, develop this idea. Israel had been punished with exile in the past, but they've never been utterly abandoned by God. And they're not going to be utterly abandoned by God, because he made promises to them. And we've seen those passages in uh, the prophet Isaiah's uh, amazing prophecies. Uh, Verse 27, just drop down please to 27. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their land and left none of them captive any longer. And I will not hide my face from them anymore, for I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And that's the end of chapter uh, 39. Uh, I believe this is referring to the fact that Israel was dispersed, you know, many times in her history, but the big ones were the Assyrian exile, and then the Babylonian exile, and then there was the uh, AD 70 tragedy, when they were dispersed among the nations, regathered in 1948, but then uh, in 1948 regathered at that time, and Remember what we've read in Ezekiel already, Ezekiel 34, 35, 36, and then 37, the the Valley of Dry Bones. 
I believe this is all referring to the fact that God promised he would bring his people back into their land, their official statehood would be recognized, and it has, but they were brought back in unbelief. They're going to come to faith in that land, in the land of Israel in the last days. So where, where are we in the timeline anyway? Where are you and I? Israel's back there, largely a non-believing nation. We're just waiting for the first domino to fall that will uh, cascade into oceans of Israelites coming to faith in Jesus. And God has many ways he's, he's going to make it happen. Um, but all of this actually uh, dovetails very nicely with the prophecies of Zechariah, which we'll get to one day. In Zechariah 12, he talks about God pouring out the, the spirit of supplication upon his nation. They will look upon him who they have pierced, and they will mourn for him, the Bible says. That's Zechariah 12. They're going to recognize Jesus for who he is. The veil will be removed from their hearts. Paul says right now, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, there's a veil that lies over their hearts when Moses is read. They can't see Jesus in the law. But one day, God's going to do a miracle, and the veil will be removed, and God will pour out his spirit on these people, and they will see Jesus for who he is. And uh, we saw that Ezekiel uh, 34, 35, 36, that talks about the new birth. Remember, um, Nicodemus came to Jesus, and he said, a good teacher, we know that you are a teacher sent from God, because no one can do these miracles that you're doing, unless God is with him. And you know what Jesus said to him? You must be born again. If you're not born again, you're not coming into the kingdom. Simple as that. And Nicodemus was shocked. He said, well, how can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter into his mother's womb a second time? And Jesus said, you're a teacher in Israel. You don't know this. Have you not read Ezekiel 36? It talks about new birth for Israel, for Israelite people. That's coming in the future. When Israel will be restored as a nation, they will recognize Christ for who he really, really is. And again, that dovetails perfectly with Zechariah 12 and 13. In Zechariah 13, you read about how Israel wakes up to who God really is, to what true religion really is at that time, and they begin on their own, under God, a purging process in Israel. All the fake religionists, all the false prophets, the charlatans, the fakes, the phonies, they better get out because they're going to be judged in accordance with the law. That's what it sounds like. And so false, phony prophets are going to say, oh, I'm not a prophet, when they're questioned. They're going to say, oh, no, I'm not a prophet. You know, I'm just a farmer. You know, and there never was a farmer who was a prophet. But they're going to talk like that. Is that true, by the way? Who's the farmer prophet? Is it not Amos? Amos, yeah. But they're going to try any excuse not to be called out for what they really are and to be punished for it. But this is all coming in the last days when Israel is converted, converted to God. So the big question here is, where do we put, where do we put the battle? It's a difficult question. There are a lot of Bible scholars now, dispensational Bible scholars now, who are teaching that the rapture of the church comes first and then comes this battle because they, they say, well, the rapture causes complete confusion on the earth and Russia and her coalition of hostile forces, they take the advantage. All these Islamic armies, mind you, they join with Russia to come against Israel and that's when God takes them out of the picture. And uh, in that vacuum comes Antichrist to establish his, his peace treaty. I'm not sure that that's what's going to happen because the battle of, that we're talking about here in Ezekiel 38-39, it brings about a large-scale conversion of Israelites and of other Gentile uh, people groups too. And yet, um, if these people are converted and walking in wisdom... Why in the world would they be snowed by the Antichrist? Why, where's that godly wisdom? It's kind of, it sounds funny to me. I'm not sure that it's going to happen like that. My personal perspective on this, for what that may be worth, I'm not sure if this is worth much, but I'll give you what I think. It seems to me 
the, when the church is raptured, this fellow, the Antichrist, appears on the scene, and he's got all the answers, and he's going to make a peace treaty with Israel, we know that, and it seems to me that the first little block of time after he establishes that treaty, that's the time when Israel's dwelling in peace and safety. And I suggest that that's when this battle takes place, early on here. And you remember the first seal of judgment in Revelation chapter 6? What is it? The first seal. The conqueror. The guy comes. We believe a counterfeit Christ is the Antichrist. So the, the first seal could be him appearing and establishing his peace treaty. Right? He conquers without force. He's got a bow but no arrows. We have a little block of time where it's peace and safety in Israel. It might be there where this coalition of forces led by Russia... Uh, invade the land, and then the next seal is broken, and it's warfare. Warfare, famine, death. It all it comes with war, right? And as those seals are being broken, Israel is really waking up to who this guy is. Because all kinds of things are happening here that are not supposed to happen when God makes a covenant with his nation, according to Ezekiel 34. So, the conversion of Israel to Christ, it, God may be using a, a number of mechanisms. What's happening in the world at that time, God may be using that. The destruction of those hostile forces, he could be using that. Certainly, the witness of God's two witnesses, they appear on the scene at the beginning of that 70th week also. So, I think that, that all that can be happening early on there. That's kind of where I put the battle, I, I think. <clears throat> Because you have to remember, at right at the middle of the midpoint here, here you have what sounds like another invasion by Russia. That's what it sounds like to me. And uh, this time, uh, it's very interesting. And why don't we just go to the book of Daniel? I'll show you what I mean. We're going to look at Daniel in some detail, but um, let's go to Daniel chapter 11. Daniel 11. Okay. Now, Daniel 11, amazing chapter. Remember in Daniel chapter 10, Daniel's praying, praying, praying. He wants information. And God gives it to him. Both barrels. Chapter 11. In chapter 11, it's, it's uh, all the way from the beginning of the chapter to verse 35. It's all intertestamental history. It's all the po political maneuverings between Syria in the north and Egypt in the south, Israel in the middle, and it's stupendously detailed and accurate. King of the north in, this, in these passages, Syria. King of the south, Egypt. Very clear, with Israel in the middle. But then you notice that in verse 35, he casts our minds far into the future. Verse, look at verse 35, Daniel eleven thirty-five, 35. And some of those of understanding shall fall to refine them, purify them, and make them white until the time of the end, because it is still for the appointed time. This is him slingshotting us now to the end of days. What you hear next, the end of the world stuff. Verse 36. Then the king shall do according to his own will. He shall exalt and magnify himself above every god, shall speak blasphemies against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the wrath has been accomplished, for what has been determined shall be done. Notice, we're not talking about king of the south, and we're not talking about king of the north anymore. We're talking about the king, which I take to be a reference to Antichrist, the world dictator. Okay? Verse 37, he shall... Regard neither the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall exalt himself above them all. But in their place he shall honor a God of fortresses and a God which his fathers did not know, with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus he shall act against the strongest fortresses with a foreign God, which he shall acknowledge and advance its glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, 
and divide the land for gain. That's a broken covenant, by, my, mind you. That's a broken covenant with Israel, dividing the land now for gain. At that time, or at that time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships, and he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. You've got to watch the pronouns here. It sounds like a pincer movement. King of the south, Egypt, moving up against Antichrist. King of the north, moving downward, southward against Antichrist also. The world dictator has a problem. Egypt and this king of the north are coming against him. Okay? It says here, um, we should read verse 40 again. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him. That's Antichrist. The king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter the countries, overwhelm them, and pass through. He shall also enter the glorious land. Now, who's that? That's the king of the north who's entering the glorious land. Watch the pronouns. The king of the north is swooping in here. He shall enter the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown, but these shall escape from his hand, Edom, Moab, and the prominent people of Ammon. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. King of the north coming straight through to conquer Egypt. Verse 43, He shall have power over the treasures of gold, silver, and over the precious things of Egypt. Also the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow at his heels. But news from the east and the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go out with great fury to destroy and annihilate many. And he shall plant his tents of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. What that sounds like to me and other, other theologians, they would say what it sounds like is king of the north, Russia, is coming through. He comes through Israel down to Egypt and conquers. But tidings from the north and the east trouble him. So he heads back to Israel and there he's destroyed. Now, what could be happening here is this. He comes down and he's the guy that kills Antichrist. Remember, the Antichrist is mortally wounded and there's a kind of resurrection event. It's very mysterious. But the book of Revelation, chapter 17, kind of talks about it. And it's, it's, a, it's cryptic, but it is, it is discernible what's happening here. He sort of dies and then comes back. And it might be that this uh, northern army comes through and kills him as they swoop down into Egypt. And when they hear he's alive, they come back to finish the job, and they're destroyed. So if this is correct, then you have a... Russian attack here at the beginning of the 70th week, close to the beginning of the 70th week, when Israel's dwelling in safety, and then a second attack here at the midpoint. It may be Russia that actually destroys Antichrist, or, or thinks they have, and tidings from the north and the east call them back to the Holy Land, where he is now reigning and ruling as the dictator. Not sure. It's a suggestion. Just a suggestion. It's an idea. So you may have two Russian assaults. Not really sure. Uh, any thoughts, questions, or comments on that? These are deep. This is supposed to be an introduction to eschatology. <laughs> but you know how these things are all hooked into each other? And um, it just gets complicated all by itself, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. I had a question. So sure. <clears throat> i do my best for you. In part with the, uh, the, the Jewish people and the veil being removed, like, is that... Just Israel itself, or like I have Jewish friends that, again, that veil is just piercing. Yeah. Uh, will, will Jews everywhere have a revelation of Jesus, or, or just the people in Israel? Well, enough that we can say that national ethnic Israel as a people group have come to faith. But remember, Ezekiel 20 says that God, um, what I take to be part of the judgments at the end of the tribulation, he will cause his Jewish uh, Jewish people will pass under the rod and he will purge out the rebels from among them. So I don't think this means that every last single solitary Jewish person comes to faith, but enough of them that we can call it a national restoration. That's my understanding. 
of that. But these are these are hard things. I mean, go ahead. Do you think it's possible that the it comes before the rapture? It could be. Then I think we'd be looking for that battle and not Jesus. Mm. We would not. There would not. That eminence would be gone, right? The eminence of his any time return. Uh, and we kind of looked at those passages earlier on, where there's quite a few of them. We are turning from idols and serving the living and true God and waiting for a son from heaven. There's any time he could come back, right? But I mean, the, to me, the possibilities are pretty broad. I'm really not sure where this battle happens. I'll offer some suggestions there. Okay. Okay, very quickly here, we want to get done with Ezekiel today. So in Ezekiel's 40 to 48, you have a picture of the millennium. I think it has to be a picture of the millennium because there's no other place there's no other place in earth history where you can put this stuff, okay? Um, just for your own notes, in Ezekiel uh, chapters 40 to 42, you're going to hear about the temple. And it's unlike anything you've ever read about. It's not Solomon's temple. It's not uh, the second temple. It, the, the plans are not anywhere else in the Bible. It, it, where are we going to put this thing, if not the millennium? And then uh, Ezekiel 43 to 46 is all about the worship the religious system there, the sacrificial system, and the calendar that's being followed, again, it, that is not mosaic. It sounds very mosaic because there's Passover and there's Sabbath, you know, and there's daily offerings and, and there is an altar and stuff. It sounds mosaic until you get down to the details and really look at what's being prescribed and then you realize this is very different than the mosaic law. This is new covenant. It's got to be. And then verse, uh, chapters 47, 48 talks about the land itself, the allotment of the land, the topographical changes that will take place. It all belongs, I believe, in the millennium. Um, it can't just be some symbolic, um, spiritualized passages that can mean anything you want them to mean. And I have some slides here for you that might be helpful to all of us. So here just to give you some pictures here. So there, there's the tabernacle uh, that Moses was commanded to build. It was, a, it was a shadow of the earthly realities, or excuse me, of heavenly realities. Remember that? These, these were um, shadows of things that actually exist in heaven. And the tabernacle, again, Moses was given specific, detailed instructions Here's how you build it. Here's the dimensions. Here's the materials. Don't deviate. It has to be like this and not like something else, right? And we just assumed that was a real structure. And Solomon's temple, excuse me, there we go. Solomon's temple, same thing. David was given the plans. God gave David the plans, said, David, get the materials. But Solomon's going to get it built. And again, you read these things in the Bible and no one's suggesting that the tabernacle or Solomon's temple was merely figurative. Because the, the floor plan, the, the instructions to get it built, the materials discussed, it's way too detailed. It just makes sense that this was real. Okay? And, of course, we talk about Herod's temple in the days of Jesus. That's a real temple for sure. Ezekiel's temple is described to us with no less exacting detail. If the tabernacle was real, if Solomon's temple was real, this thing has got to be real. But it's very different from these temples that we've read about uh, before. It's too large for the uh, current temple court, 875 feet square. As you read through Ezekiel's uh, instructions on this, there are 318 precise measurements given. The doorways are all explained to you. know, Make the doorways like this and not like something else. It, if this is symbolic, what is, what is it symbolic of? <laughs> no one can, can tell you that. 37 unique architectural words. It's got to be a literal physical temple. And there are marked differences from the Old Testament law. And that's a major topic of discussion. So where do you put this thing? How do you understand this thing? I don't believe it's a separate priestly tradition. I don't believe it's provisional. Like if you can't follow the Mosaic law, you can do this other thing. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Uh, some people have suggested that. I think the only place to put this is in the millennium, in the, in the kingdom age. 
Um, by the way, I'm just going to rip through this stuff, but I can easily convert this to a PDF for whoever wants it. I can easily do that. And you can let me know, I'll email it to you. But uh, priests live, live, uh, live near the temple, but according to the Mosaic law, the priests live within each tribe. Uh, we're going to see a return of the Shekinah glory, according to Ezekiel. And uh, notice the, the land allotment here. Look at the tribes of Israel as, as uh, they were allotted in the days of, of Moses and Joshua. In Ezekiel, it's totally different. They're sort of laid out in east-west stripes across the land. The, whole, the land allotment for the tribes is different. And there is, uh, right through Jerusalem, there is the sacred tract there where the temple is. In Ezekiel's temple, there's no wall excluding the Gentiles because Jesus Christ has broken down that wall. There's no labor because the, word, it's the words of Christ cleanse us. There's no table of showbread because Jesus Christ is the true bread that comes down from heaven. There's no lampstand because Jesus is the light of the world. Uh, there's no altar of incense because Jesus makes intercession for us, as it says in Hebrews 7.25. There's no veil anymore because when Jesus died, the veil was rent. There's no need for a veil. And there's no Ark of the Covenant either. Yeah. So where would Jewish scholars put this? Or what do they think about? Well, they're going to debate it. So some would say if they're liberals, it's just a competing priestly tradition. It runs parallel to, to the Mosaic tradition, which we don't hold to that. Uh, others would say it's provisional. This is something you could, you could put in place if you were unable to perform the Mosaic Law. But they have no like, proof that it was ever used? There's no, there's no historical evidence this was ever implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no Ark of the Covenant because Jesus Christ has become the Hilasterion, the mercy seat for us. Right? He, re he replaces all that. Um, you have an, an altar of anoint... Or, the altar is anointed in Exodus 29, but in Ezekiel's prophecy, there's no anointing of the altar, but the altar is consecrated. Um, in the law, it's a ram for consecration of the priesthood. In Ezekiel, a ram is uh, for the altar only. So there's a difference there. In the law, the high priest alone can enter the most holy place, but in Ezekiel's prophecy, all the priests can enter. These are going to be Zadokian priests. Remember Zadok? He was faithful to David during Absalom's rebellion, and God said, that's it, your family line, you're going to be priests in my kingdom age, Zadokian priests. And um, Ezekiel 44, 22, we have rules applicable only to the high priest. Uh, now they, they apply to all the priests. Um, the altar approached from stairs from the east in Ezekiel 43, but the stairs were forbidden in, Ezekiel, or in Exodus 20. And um, the altar was approached from the south. So it's, all, it's configured totally differently. The first of Nisan is not a special day under the law, but it will be a special day according to Ezekiel 45.18 on that calendar. And then changes to the sacrificial system. Uh, this gets really, really tedious. And I don't know if you want to go through all this. We did go through this in detail in my uh, Five Worlds course, my course on Bible cosmology. But again... Um, for the sin offering, Ezekiel says the blood is daubed and the parts of the animal are burned outside. And day one, one bull, days two to seven, one kid, two bulls, one ram. But look, according to the law, one bull, two rams. Days two to seven, one bull only. See, these are sl slight changes, but there's enough to show us that this is not mosaic, Okay. Um, again, Sabbath offering, Ezekiel says six lambs, one ram. The law says just two lambs. New moon offering, Ezekiel, one bull, one ram, six lambs. The law, two bulls, one ram, seven lambs. Changes to the sacrificial system regarding the daily sacrifice. Ezekiel says one lamb in the morning. The law says two lambs, one in the morning, one at night. At Passover, this figure called the prince, he reforms ritual on behalf of the nation but in the law, it's a family affair. The head of the household will slaughter the lamb, perform the rituals. In Ezekiel, at the Passover, one bull daily through seven days. Seven bulls are burnt, seven rams are burnt, and it looks like a kid is offered as a sin offering. According to the law, one lamb daily through seven days. Two bulls are burnt, one ram. 
and one kid for a sin, a sin offering. And again, tabernacles, booths, we have significant changes also. I'm not going to get into all that. I do want to address quickly the issue of why we have animal sacrifice in the millennium in the first place. Anyone wonder about that? Why are, why are we having to kill a bunch of animals if we've returned to Eden-like conditions? <coughs> I'm going to give you my perspective on this. This is what I think. And um, you can think about it, okay? First of all, in the millennium, death will be extremely rare. So when you kill an animal and you feel this animal is warm and its heart is beating and it's breathing and you slit its throat and it bleeds out and dies in front of you, that's very dramatic. And that's going to remind you of Christ's sacrifice. This is a memorial view of Christ's uh, work on the earth, his, um, his redemptive work that he accomplished. So his work will be depicted for us in the sacrifices And those will be solemn reminders of the graveness of sin, the seriousness of sin, Christ's greatness, and of Christ's love. We're going to see that spelled out there in in these memorial sacrifices. Um, We also have to remember that sin will still be present on the earth in the millennium. So the animal sacrifices are intended to cleanse, purify, and sanctify the temple, the furniture, and the utensils. That is important to understand that. Actually, Ezekiel will talk about it. Look what it says here, Ezekiel 45, 21. In the first month, in the 14th day of the month, you shall have a Passover, a feast of seven days, unleavened bread shall be eaten, and upon that day the prince prepare for himself and for all the people of the land a bullock for a sin offering. And seven days of the feast shall prepare a burnt offering to the Lord, seven bullocks and seven rams, without blemish daily for seven days, and a kid of the goats daily for a sin offering. Seven days thou shalt prepare every day a goat for a sin offering. They shall also prepare a young bullock and a ram out of the flock without blemish. Seven days they shall purge the altar and purify it. The blood of these animals is being applied to us and to the altar and to the utensils to purify it. And they shall consecrate themselves, and and when these days are expired, it shall be that upon the eighth day and so forward, the priests shall make burnt offerings upon the altar and your peace offerings, and I will accept you, saith the Lord God. I will accept you, he says. It seems to me that the church of Jesus Christ, us living in this dispensation, God has made special provision for us that he hasn't made for other people. The Holy Spirit can actually dwell in us despite sin in our flesh. He he wasn't doing that before. Not the way he's doing it now. There's something special. We don't need to slay animals to come into the direct presence of God. Christ is our Passover sacrifice for us. But we get raptured out And Israel gets called back in to be God's ambassadors on the earth, right? And those who are alive go into the millennium with mortal bodies. And you know what's in those mortal bodies? Sin. And if they want to come into close proximity to God, they're going to have to shed animal blood to do it. It's for the sanctifying of their flesh. I'll show you that in just a sec here, okay? Uh, And this slide here kind of explains it, but I want to show you something in the book of Hebrews. People are still going to require theocratic forgiveness. We're still saved by grace through faith, but our sinful flesh still exists. And um, those who are not in the church at that time in their mortal bodies, they are going to need to present innocent animal blood so that God will see the innocence of the animal and the faith of the offerer. Just go to the book of Hebrews, please. Chapter 9, Hebrews 9. And I'll show you what I mean. Hebrews 9. Okay, verse 13. For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. 
Did you notice in verse 13 that the blood of bulls and goats did sanctify for the purifying of the flesh? We're, what we're saying here is that for the church, we are set apart, sanctified, body, soul, and spirit, and Christ can actually live in us in the person of the Holy Spirit despite the persistence of sin in our flesh. One day we're going to be glorified, there will be no more sin in our flesh. But even now in this dispensation, we can be that close to our God. But God has not made that provision for those outside the church. So in the millennium, those with mortal bodies, if they want to come into the direct presence of God, they're going to have to offer animal blood. Okay, Only Christ can sanctify and purify the conscience but that sin in the flesh needs to be dealt with. And this is how God's chosen to do it in the millennium. I believe animal sacrifices are going to be there, and there's a purpose for it. And I hope that makes sense to you. Uh, the Bible says that uh, in Ezekiel agrees with um, Zechariah. Zechariah says there's going to be this great earthquake, and the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. I'll just quickly get to that. And then, then I'll be done here. But there's Zechariah 14. It says there's going to be this earthquake that splits the Mount of Olives in two, and the two halves of the mountain will move north and south. There'll be a huge valley in the middle there. And if you notice, that valley is going to open up right to the Mediterranean Sea or the Great Sea, and the two bodies of water, the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean, are going to be connected. And that's why uh, you can just see here, look at that topographical chart there. You, imagine you rip a huge valley there and um, you can see water cascading into the Dead Sea. It says here in Ezekiel chapter uh, 47, verse, uh, verse 8. Then he said to me, this water flows toward the eastern region, goes down into the valley, and enters the sea. And when it reaches the sea, its waters are healed. And, and it shall be that every living thing that moves whether the, wherever the rivers go shall, will live. There will be a great multitude of fish because these waters go there, for they will be healed. And everything will live wherever the river goes. And it shall be that fishermen will stand by it from en -Gedi, to end Gilaim, and they will be places for spreading their nets. Their fish will be of the same kinds as the fish of the great sea, exceedingly many. Well, end Gedi is on the north shore of the Dead Sea, and fishermen are going to put their nets there and catch fish. So these prophets agree with each other that there's going to be stupendous topographical uh, changes here to the land. This whole area is going to be lifted up. It will become a plain lifted up a tremendous valley, ripped right through it, bringing waters from the Mediterranean into the uh, Dead Sea. So Isaiah 2.2, remember it says, It shall come to pass in the last day that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all the nations shall flow into it. Many people shall go and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of Jacob, and he will teach us his ways and so on. The law will go out of Zion. And uh, so these things, they all sort of agree with each other. We can expect amazing changes in the future. And you and I, we get a ringside seat. We get to watch all of it. And in fact, we get to participate in it. We return with Jesus too. A mounted posse returning with Jesus at the end of the tribulation period. Obadiah calls us the saviors. Saviors are coming with the Lord. That's us. To establish his kingdom on the earth. It's the kingdom that we pray for. It's coming. It'll come with power one day. So, so that's so much for Ezekiel. We'll, be, we'll begin with Daniel the next time we talk eschatology. Any final thoughts, questions, or comments about anything we covered? Or are you more thoroughly confused than you were before? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> yes, Betty. The return you were just mentioning, uh, will that be a physical kind of return to Israel for us? Or will that we will be kind of dispersed over the world? We're, we're definitely returning with him. We're definitely coming back with him. And he is returning to Israel because the prophecy says his feet will actually touch the Mount of Olives. And that's actually what splits the mountain in half. And remember, Jesus said, where my servant is, there, there will I be. And Jesus said that we'll always be with him. 
And Paul said it too. Thus we will always be with the Lord. So I'm not sure what the kingdom looks like for us. All I know is wherever he is, we're there too. And I'm sure he has us doing all kinds of important things. But what exactly we're doing, I really don't know. But none of us are going to feel dissatisfied with whatever job we have. I bet you that. We'll be happy with whatever jobs. But, but yeah, he's not going to send us away from him to, get, to accomplish something. Somehow, some way, we're always with him working. Any other thoughts, questions? Yeah, Judith. Um, I did a little bit of reading myself. Okay. So this is not a challenge, but a it's question, okay. But a question. Yeah. Um, if the this war takes place at the beginning of the tribulation, like it says that these weapons of war are all wood, um, and that Israel doesn't have any, um, like. In terms of technology, all the technology is gone. And then it says that these uh, weapons are burned for seven years. Yeah. Partway through, Israel goes. Like, who's attending and burning all these things if Israel's headed to the hills? Yeah, I, I wonder, so on the scenario that I suggest, the, the burning of the weapons and the burying of the bones of the dead, that would be postponed until the end of the tribulation. Yeah, it would, it would be postponed. Um, I'm not sure that the text sort of suggests that it happens immediately, but I wonder if we need to adopt that interpretation. I know there are others who don't. So I just offer that. It's a, it's a very difficult passage, so we do our best with it. So I, I'm just suggesting a scenario. It's probably wrong, but you know, <laughs> it's do the best I can. Any other? Rick, you got a question there? Oh, I thought you just stretch it. Okay, let's close with a prayer. And then we're still under the hour mark. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that you're here with us today in the person of the Blessed Holy Spirit. Lord, thank you for helping us get through these hard passages. Thank you that Daniel's next, and that is way easier. <laughs> Lord, thank you for that blessing also. We ask you to go with us tonight, be with us, protect your people, guide us in the way we should go. For your honor and glory and for the blessing of others also, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God. Okay, God bless you all.